And joining Sheila. us on this adventure, Sheila, will be our wonderful producer and radio host of Urban Psychosis, Bobby Vicarious, <laughs> or Vicarious. Is it Vicarious? Maybe not. <laughs> I think it's ready for Bobby Litch to speak. <laughs> okay. And Amanda Jean Deering, um, who is, oh my God, that's right, I've got to read it, Amanda. The bio. No, I just, just. Bio. Universal shaman and 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 uh, you know and and keen metaphysicist. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I'm doing the whole thing again because it was hilarious last time. Are you ready? A master <laughs> teacher, a writer, a natural holistic practitioner, and a universal shaman psychic. See that? You see, it starts off well. It's when we get into the niche. The niche. So she has been actively on her path for 25 years and has the joy and pleasure to be doing what she loves for her career. Yay. She is a traditional naturopath, master herbalist, herbalist, master counsellor, remedial massage practitioner, external sport injury practitioner. Oh, you need to talk to Sheila about that. As well as a practitioner of reflexology cupping, Gu Shao. Gu Shao. Acupressure and ear candling. She is also, like Sheila, a minister of metaphysical science, Uzai, Reiki master, universal shaman, psychic, intuitive, spirit artist, as well as practitioner of crystal healing, Pelawa healing, angelic healing, arba healing, past life assimilation, sacred geometric alignment, vibrational healing, and rainbow spirit healing. As the founder of the Universal Lightworking Academy, she teaches courses and workshops on a variety of subjects from natural therapies to esoteric studies. How'd I do? Well done. Well done. <laughs> I I Could have just quite, quite easily briefed it into, you know, uh, you know, a universal shaman who likes metaphysical stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Why waste it? Now, guys, if you want to check out what else Amanda does, because I'm sure there's another, I'm sure that was the short bio, um, go to www.amanda-gene.com and um, you can check out Bobby um, every when, every Thursday, um, three hours before this show, so on freedomslips.com, urban psychosis. And, of course, Sheila. Sheila, have you got Sheila sheila.sheila.kennedy.com up and running yet? Sheila-Kennedy.com, yes. Okay, and if you want to check out uh, the magazine, it's Oddities E-Club magazine. Um, so you go to um, OdditiesEclub.com, and although you probably prefer to go to YouTube and uh, go and uh, select and check out some of our interviews online, there's some fantastic stuff in there. Um, and I was actually going to suggest that I do a one-on-one -on -one with Sheila coming up in the new year if she's keen. Of course you're keen, aren't you, Sheila? <laughs> <laughs> Left you hanging there. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, I know. The, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm in the huge metropolis of Sydney, and the, my girlfriend who crushed her foot and I've come to stay with, um, while she hobbled around on her crutches and so on, has amazing internet, except it's not working on my computer and it keeps cutting in and out. So you dropped out for a second there. Sorry, Sharon. It was at a pivotal moment, wasn't it, Amanda? It oh, was. <laughs> it was, it was. You definitely <laughs> left me hanging because I said, I'd love to do an interview with you this year, and then you didn't answer. <laughs> oh, that, that sounds like fun. Thank you. Cool. That's good. So tonight, <laughs> good night, ladies and gent. Um, it, is that your, your preferred gender pronoun, Bobby, by the way? <laughs> what was that? I missed the gender pronoun. Uh, well, I'm just um, I know that now you have to ask these things. So, are you happy to be a man, or should I? Um, yeah, that's that's what I've been for a long time. Although Bobby's <laughs> kind of unisex, right? But but I do prefer to be a man, and I've been a man for like 69 years. Lovely. I just, and, and I just celebrated 69. And Sheila, Happy birthday. Sheila. Hey. thank you. So, um, Sheila and Amanda, are you also happy to be referred to as? female or or a woman absolutely uh yeah yeah i've been been one for the last 37 years i'm sure uh you know i'll keep i'm happy to keep it so yeah i i, I have <laughs> recently discovered that i want to be a model so i now want to be referred to as trans model 
<laughs> so I, I believe you can say something. So you can refer to me as or, or I also answer to trans millionaire. So I'm hoping things come to me. So, um, yeah, so you, you, you pick the pronoun. So I'm, I'm fine with anything. So, so tonight, ladies, we're going to um, have a big chat about the Trump phenomenon as usual. This is, this is yeah, it's quite funny. When, when we started doing these radio shows, this is like the fourth or the fifth one now, I only thought it would be one or two shows, but uh, Trump's like the gift that just keeps on giving. Yeah, I mean, no matter, every day there's something new. And um, so we're now up to the fourth or the fifth show. And seriously, I've still got at least five or six um, topics that we could be covering. Because I always thought we'd do a couple of Trump shows, then we'd move into like intersectionality shows and do a couple on those or or on different different kind of uh, talking points in society. But we're not getting anywhere near that <laughs> because of Trump. <laughs> he just takes all the air out of the room, doesn't he? It's just just amazing. So if, if but as long as you guys are happy to do this, Bobby and, and Amanda and Cassie when she gets back. Um, I'm happy to keep doing them if you are. <laughs> sure. It's, yeah, uh, it's yeah, fun yeah. and educational too. It is, it is. Yeah, it? Absolutely. So, so, so tonight our first topic we're going to cover, we're going to cover a few. The first one will be the Kavanaugh confirmation and a little bit on the Me Too, hashtag Me Too movement. We're then going to move into the Putin and Trump versus the USA intelligence community. Whoever thought we'd have a title like that ever. And if we get to it, um, the third one will be building the wall and the illegal immigrant caravans. So I'm not sure if we're going to get there, but we'll just move that over to the next session. So um, and then we may even get into, um, you know, uh, what's going on with the Democrats or um, and you know these and we might talk a bit about q i was thinking next time we might actually talk about q um it's i reckon we could do the whole show on q alone um and are you guys all on the q bandwagon or is this something that we knew for you um i'm on to q but he's kind of been kind of quiet lately or he's, yeah, he, he kind of dropped out. A lot of people think that the reason he did that was leading up to the midterms, um, if he is part of the um, the inner circle or he's actually an elected official, they're not supposed to be promoting anything within so many days before and after, apparently. So that's probably why he went off the air. That sounds like a good reason. Yeah, so, so I... I think that's what you'll probably find it is, Bobby, that um, he's really up there. He's quite high up, I'd say. Um, who do you think it is? I, I think it's, you know, someone in his inner circle, obviously. And, I, think, uh, I think it's Ivanka. <laughs> I'm not sure I think it's her. her. I, you know, I was, you know. Because today he, um, whoever it was, was... A lot of times when he's been doing public speaking, somebody else has been do, do, tweeting at the same time. Can you schedule tweets to go off? Or yes. I, I don't know enough about Twitter. So, so you I can't, don't know. I've never tried it, Twitter. Is, and also the like the, the wording, the way. It's some, you know how like most parents and children have a similar way of speaking? So I, yeah. I was... Yeah, I was thinking along those lines. And she is the inner circle. She's like his main advisor. Um, well, she certainly is a brilliant woman, so she, you know, she could do it. Uh, but I was just thinking it was someone else. I, I'm not sure who, but definitely close. Yeah, it's it's gonna be interesting. But but I I reckon we could spend a whole show just talking about Q and Trump and that. So if you're keen, that might be an upcoming show. So let's get Very to good. it. Mm. The Kavanaugh confirmation and hashtag me too. So I'll start as usual with the definition. President Donald Trump nominated Judge Brett Kavanaugh to become an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States on July 9th, 2018, filling the vacancy left by the retirement of Anthony Kennedy. When nominated, Kavanaugh was a sitting judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. The Senate Judiciary Committee began Kavanaugh's confirmation hearing on September the 4th this year. At the end of the confirmation process, Kavanaugh was accused of 
sexually assaulting Christine Blasey Ford 36 years prior, while they were both in high school in 1982. The Senate Judiciary Committee postponed its scheduled vote to allow both Blasey Ford and Kavanaugh to respond. In the interim, two other women, Deborah Ramirez and a Julie Sweat Swetnick, allege separate instances of sexual assault. Kavanaugh categorically denied allegations made by Ford, Ramirez and Swetnick. Both Kavanaugh and Blasey Ford were questioned by members of the Judiciary Committee and Arizona-based sex crimes prosecutor, Rachel, Rachel Mitchell, on September the 27th. The following day, the Judiciary Committee voted 11 to 10, very, very slim, to send the nomination to the floor. Senator Jeff Flake, a Republican in Arizona, and later the full Senate Judiciary Committee requested a week-long FBI supplemental background investigation into the sexual assault allegations. On October the 6th, the Senate voted 50 to 48 to confirm Kavanaugh's nomination to the Supreme Court post the FBI findings. And it was an interesting finding because they didn't allow the report to go outside of a seal, what they call a skiff, which is a, a sealed room. So no one can, and no one was allowed in with any devices. So whatever they read in that FBI report um, voted him in, which is interesting, but we'll never get to see that obviously. Now, Okay, so has everyone got that in their heads before we begin? Yep. Okay. Yep, yep. sounds good. Great. So we'll, we'll kick off with Bobby. So, Bobby, considering that conservative Brett Kavanaugh was replacing Anthony Kennedy, another conservative-leaning judge, do you think the request by the Democratic senators for President Trump to select a more left-leaning judge was inappropriate? Or should each new appointment to the Supreme Court be on a bipartisan basis? Um, I think ideally <coughs> appointments to the Supreme Court ought to be on a bipartisan basis, but that's not in reality the way it goes. And uh, therefore, I think replacing Anthony Kennedy with another conservative uh, leaning ju judge is justified. But the whole idea of a Supreme Court justice is that he should be able to weigh the information, you know, based on the based on the information that's presented, and weigh it and come up with an answer, and uh, therefore it shouldn't really matter whether he's Republican or Democrat. And I think Brett Kavanaugh can can remain objective. Yes, no, I I agree. Um, Sheila. What do you think? Yeah. Do you think the new appointment to the Supreme Court should be selected on a bipartisan basis? Look, I, I'm with you and Bobby. Um, I didn't uh, see a lot of it in the early part of um, the whole process. And then something you mentioned a couple of months ago, and it was like, oh, I must read up a bit more on that. And it, it's like, let's a, a lynch party almost isn't it oh god yeah it was yeah i, I am i i am pro-trump as we all know um but I, even i was shocked at the level of vitriol um thrown at this man yeah so um and so i mean it, it isn't supposed to be bipartisan the whole process you're right bobby it really isn't it's supposed to be the best Basically, the Supreme Court is the epitome of where, if you're a judge, that's that's like Nirvana. That's where you want to get to. So it should be based on the last 30 years of your judgments and how you, if you if you adhered to the law and if you um, were a good judge. That's what it should be based on, not on what party you you align with. Um, but what's happened is, I believe it it stopped being that when um, just after Bush. And they started to vote in judges based on their political leanings, um, which is really sad. Um, and now it has become a you know it has become a party you know thing. And at the moment, I believe there's more conservatives on there than liberal. Is that correct, Bobby? Or is it? I think. I think yeah, I think it's slightly more conservative. But the other like, thing to keep in mind is these people are appointed for life. And Kavanaugh's a young man, relatively speaking. Yeah, so he's going to be there for 
for quite some time. I'm I have a feeling that um that woman who's like just had the accident. What's her name? Uh, the oh, I've her yeah, name. I know who you mean. I, I think she's going to be stepping down. She's um, eighty five, and she just had the uh, she just had a, another accident, a falling over accident. Yeah, so, plus she's pretty useless. I mean, she falls asleep at times and all this <laughs> kind of stuff. <laughs> I didn't know that. But um, I saw her on a show, and she looked decrepit. I've got to say it. She was kind of a – there was something wrong with her arms. They were kind of into her body, and she was kind of leaning. I mean, her, I'm sure her brain's still there um, because she was speaking quite eloquently, but her body was just – oh, my God, it was – I, I kind of looked at her and thought, let her retire, you know, <laughs> let her have some time to, you know, have some. I was actually a bit shocked. I, and she, but she is very left leaning. She's I'd actually call her a leftist. And some of the judgments she's made we, would make you blush. Seriously. Um, yeah, well, I'm sure the, the Democratic Party is putting process, putting pressure on her to hang out for, you know, another couple of years so that. There'll be a Democrat in the presidency, you know. Just, just hang on, you know. Don't, don't die yet, or don't resign. But I think she's going to step down. I think she has to. Oh, well, so do I. I mean, from what I saw, like I've seen her in two different events now, and both times, you know, she, she looks like she needs a rest. <laughs> she needs let her, let her just have the last few years, you know, enjoyably with her family and friends, you know. Um, but anyway, so I, I agree with you. I reckon she'll go, and I think there's a potential other one. So in the next two to three years, so there will be a very. I think by the time Trump leaves the presidency, because I I believe he'll get voted back in in 2020. I believe by the time he leaves, there'll only be a couple of liberals left on that Supreme Court, which I think will be a good thing down the track. But then I'm very conservative. <laughs> if you're more, if you're more. Um, you know, lefty related, you probably, that's like a horror story for most people. So, um, Amanda, so considering that conservative Brett Kavanaugh was replacing Anthony Kennedy, another conservative leaning judge, do you think the request by the Democratic senators for President Trump to select a more left leaning judge was inappropriate? Or should each new appointment to the Supreme Court be on a bipartisan basis? What, do you, what are your feelings? Uh, well, especially where, like, yeah, as Bobby said, these guys are going in for life. Like, you know, I mean, the, you don't you don't get to Supreme Judge and sort of go, oh, I'm just going to be here for like five years and uh, that's all I'm planning on doing, um, like a lot of our, our politicians. Um, you know, they, they go in there and they expect to be in that position for as long as they can. And, I mean, lovely that's falling over and, and being a little bit decrepit. I mean, she's showing it. She is trying to be there as long as she can and, and you know, um, all that sort of thing. So really it's, um, I mean, when you look at it, really they should be, if, if you want a Supreme judge that can do the job and, and can be, I guess, uh, you know, do the job properly, they have to be actually unaligned. They have to be, you know, they have to be someone that, that, that can see both sides of the story and play, and take the take the information and and use it and and play the role of being the mediator the the um non-aligned mediator so i mean for um you know like real you know i know what you're saying it's the to select to select yeah to select a left to select a lefty like you know a lefty or a righty really when you think about it. if you're selecting a lefty or a righty at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're putting someone in there that has a particular thought pattern or wavelength. And that means that everything that they they judge on, any decisions they make is going to be is going to be backed by that left or right hand thought pattern. That's that's what it comes down to. You really need like really a Supreme Supreme Court judge should be someone that can sit squarely in the middle and go, I can see both sides of the story. But I can also see what what is sitting in front of me, the evidence or the information sitting in front of me, and from the outside point of view of looking in, this is what I believe to be the right choice or, or the the ultimate outcome. Um, you know, so it, you know, should it? 
I don't even think it should be bipartisan. I, should, I think it should be completely and utterly non-aligned because otherwise you you really are, even even bipartisan, yeah, if they've got the support of both parties, that's great, but that means that they can be swayed either way, whereas, you know, and that, and I mean, look, to say that money doesn't get handed around is a load of crap, um, you know, it's, um, so at the end of the day, I, I think, you know, if you can find someone that, and I mean, it's really hard, and I, I don't profess it to be an easy thing, but someone that can actually say, well, actually, I don't align with anybody, I'm actually, I'm actually happy to see what the information is and make my decision on that. That is essentially who you want to be Supreme Court judge. Um, but also, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, look, you, you want someone that has got the, um, the experience and the understanding of what the role is going to entail too because, you know, I mean, just to, you know, if you've only been a certain style judge for so long, well, then that's all you really know. You don't. If, if you if you haven't got the experience or the broad broad experience that a Supreme Court judge will require, well then really it makes it very very hard to be um, uh, you know to, to be to be non non biased or, or you know uh, unaligned so or, or have a particular way of thinking. I, I think I think the problem's been that um, a couple of the liberal ones that have got on to the Supreme Court have been voting outside the constitution on certain things or not. They basically been interpreting the constitution rather than um, about, you know, following the lines of it. And um, mm. yeah, they've been interpreting it is, is how people kind yeah. of have been referring to it. And so I don't think it was an issue until um, Road versus Wade, which was the abortion, um, basically saying that, all women can have abortions up to, you know, the week before you actually give birth and all this sort of thing. So yeah. it's I find it amazing as a as a third person looking in on that particular debate, how how Americans never break it down to what it to the smaller areas of abortion. It's always you either are for it or against it. Whereas I think if you actually sat down with Republicans and actually discussed it with them, you'd find that what Republicans don't want to see is abortions occurring in the third trimester or even the second trimester. Mm. But up until eight weeks, until the heart starts beating, basically, I think, um, which is around the eight, ten week mark, um, if, if there's a reason there's been something occur, a rape or something like that, um, most Republicans, I think, would actually be behind abortions up to a certain week, maybe eight or ten. And um, whereas I think because they, they all look at it from this, either you're for killing babies or you're not for killing babies, rather than actually like drill it down. Um, I, I know they did mm. one of the one of the, the shows over there went out to uh, and actually started interviewing people on the street and said, oh, so basically in certain states, they could basically the week before a baby's born. So we're talking uh, 39 weeks. They could kill a baby, basically, but they don't see even a 39-week baby as a baby there. They still call it a clump of cells, which is ridiculous. Mm. I mean, I mean, you, if you, you've seen Premies, Premies come out uh, after 20, 22 weeks now, and they still look like a baby. Mm. They, you know, and I think a lot of the problem is people just don't have that discussion. They don't go to the next level of the abortion discussion. It's either we're either for it or against it. But I think a lot of people mm. before it, before the heart beats, which is about eight or ten weeks. Um, again, I'm not too sure on that. Um, does anyone know when the when the heart beats? Usually, uh, yeah, I think it's about eight weeks. Mm. Yeah. So I mean, that's kind of where what my personal stance is. I mean, I think when, once the heart's beating, I think you've got a, you've got a kid in there personally. Um, and I think from my own experience of I've had two kids and I've had three miscarriages in between. And in that in that situation, I knew with each of those miscarriages um, what was going on with my body from about between three weeks and six weeks. I knew I was pregnant, you know what I mean? So yes. it wasn't something that you don't know. I mean, and the fact is in Australia, I don't know if it's the same in the States, but if you're raped in Australia and you go to the police and report it, the first thing they do is you go to the hospital, they do a rape kit. Part of the rape kit is to give you the morning after pill so you don't fall pregnant. 
So it's part of that that process. So, I mean, it's not an issue for rape victims in Australia if it's reported. If it goes unreported, of course, then it becomes an issue. Um, but I think I think what most people also miss on this this particular issue is the fact that, and I, I went and checked the statistics on this in Australia a couple of weeks ago because I couldn't believe what I was being told. But do you know in Australia only 3% of, of the reason people have abortions is for rape? It's 97% is they just haven't managed the um, their contraception. They just fall pregnant and don't, don't realise they've missed a period. Do you guys realise that? Oh, wow. Do you, no. you know, I don't That's know the statistics. <laughs> I would assume it's similar here, but I don't know. Yeah, so basically the, the reason that they give all the time in these discussions, oh, what if they're raped? Or It's like the worst possible case, but in Australia, that's only 3% of the abortions. 97% mm. is, I didn't take my pill or oh, I couldn't be bothered, it was in the moment, you know. But, I mean, if, if you're willing to take the chance, <laughs> you know, that... Oh. Yeah. That to me is just like, are you a stupid person? How do you not manage your sexual reproduction? I mean, I, I mean, I just don't understand that. Um, ladies, help me. How do? How is a woman in 2018 not manage her own reproduction? Just explain that. Mm. You can't explain it, can you? <laughs> well, I, I, I think Sharon, having grandchildren. And grandchildren from 30-something down to a little baby. Um, I've had some really interesting conversations about reproduction and, um, you know, who's responsible. Um, and my, I remember one of my grandsons actually saying to me um, when his father and stepmother were having a, a, an additional baby, um, he was quite irate about the fact and he was blaming his father. And I advocate and said, well, actually, it takes two people to create a baby. And what says that it's all the man's fault, the woman has a level of responsibility as well. It should be a joint situation. And he was quite horrified that I could actually blame his stepmother. as what he saw. And, you know, it, it was all his father's fault. And it, it took quite a lot of... Um, Gentle persuasion, shall we say, to get him to look at it from my perspective. Um, that you know, it's not always the man's fault, it takes two to tango. And women have in this day and age so many options that weren't available. Um, you know, we didn't basically have the pill when I was growing up, or we did, it didn't work on me. Um, but you know. You see the young ones go and have those metal rod things put in their arm, whatever they are, that are, um, you know, some form of contraception. Personally, I wouldn't like it. Um, and, and one of my granddaughters gave me the other week, she'd had hers removed at 19 because she thinks she'd like a baby. To me, she still is a baby. And I will also mm. admit to the fact that, her one of her cousins when I said to him at, at, at a very young age you know darling you you guys are really very young and he said Nan I seem to recall Uncle Stephen who turned 50 on last Monday um saying that you had him when you were 18 well yes I did but I was a lot more mature at 18 than you are um and etc 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 so there are there are circumstances and there are reasons and there are a whole range of things and we didn't have, again, the level of sex education that's available now or the the internet or movies and things like that. So maybe I'm being a, an old lady or whatever it might be, but I think because there are so many choices available, including the morning after pill, and I'm not too sure that I like the idea of that, but I guess given certain circumstances, but it just seems to be a, a, a lackadaisical attitude of, oh, well, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. And, and I find that difficult. Yes, it's, you know, it's perplexing. And I suppose... Um, but then I, I... You go, Amanda. I, I also, I, I tend to notice it comes in waves, though, too. Like, it's almost like at the moment, and, and it's... Um, 
you know, in the last few years, it's become a bit of a fad to be a young mum, like a young, yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Like it's um, you know, like and and part of that is the Australian, uh, I think, uh, lifestyle of welfare and um, all that sort of stuff that brings that about is that whole um. Uh, you know, like, you know, getting money for nothing, you can stay at home, you don't have to go out yep. and work, you don't have to get a job, you know, and, and, you know, too bad, so sad. I mean, now you can't even put an unknown father on your on your birth certificate. You have to list who the father is. And the father has to, regardless of whether or not they, it's, um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it, it's it's. I think it's become a bit of a, a you know, a, a bit of a, a, a fad now, especially with a lot of younger people. That oh well, I just want to be a mum. I just want to stay at home. I just want to be able to go for coffee and go to the gym and 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 have that. And, and especially where you know, uh, the lifestyle of being mum is glorified over uh, Instagram and social media and and all that sort of stuff. When, you know, I mean, I mean, even now, yeah, I didn't have. Yeah. A- when I had kids, so no, that's, that's where I'm. I, I, like, yeah, I mean, I think I'd, I think I'd rather work. What about you, Sheila? Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and I mean, I have, I have no desire to have children. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm incredibly, you know, lucky to be a very interactive auntie and and uh, you know, and step auntie and and all that sort of thing. So, so for me, or adoptive auntie. So for for me, I'm, um, you know, like. You know, and, and it's uh, like my little sister, she, she had her, her children when she was younger, um, but she was also one of those mature people in her, in her mindset, in, in her brain. I mean, you know, she was, she'd already bought her house. She'd already, she'd already gotten her, herself set up financially to be able to, to have children at a, you know, a tender age of, uh, I think, about 21. So, yeah, I mean, like, or, or 20. So, I mean, you, you sort of, you've got to, you know, again, it, it, it depends on the person, but, you know, there seems to be a lot of a, a lot of younger people that are having babies purely because they want to keep up with every other, you know, uh, you know, Mr. Jones and Mrs. Jones that um, is, you know, having these babies and producing, um, you know, and having, you know, lavish affairs and, and, and all that sort of stuff with their, with their kids on Instagram, you know what I mean? It's... Um, you know, there's this, uh, you know, a real, and 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 unfortunately, they, it's the the other side that hang on, you still got to raise that child for the next at least eighteen years, you know, and that's then not including, uh, you know, guiding them through their 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 twenties, and, and that's what it is, guiding them. You you start to then guide your children. It's not that you you raise them, you then start to guide them, and then you know, because I mean, surely you would know with having and. and with having grandbabies now, like, you know, suddenly the kids come to you going, oh, God, I don't know what to do with buddy little Johnny because, oh, shit, you know, he's, he's got this, he's got that, and da, 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 and it's like, well, okay, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And, you know, it, the role changes as a parent. You don't ever give up your kids. You don't ever – so it's – I find it really hilarious that they think being a, a young mum or a young – thing is is really cool because you know I get to be on Instagram with my baby and you know wear the latest clothing with it or something but then um, I get to stay home but you you never give up that child it's it's a, a choice that you make that if you bring that child into the world no matter what age you bring it in you have that child for life it's it doesn't it doesn't leave you the moment that it turns 18 it doesn't leave you the moment it turns 21 it, it's just that your role with that child changes my, th- yeah. my, th- my 21-year-old just graduated a couple of days ago and um, she's already informed me on a number of occasions that she's not planning on ever moving out and so they don't. <laughs> I think I, this is the problem. Um, yeah. But anyway, we should probably move on to the second question. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go to um, Sheila first. So um, during the confirmation process, Sheila, Kavanaugh was accused of sexually assaulting Christian, sorry, Christine Lazy Ford, currently a professor in clinical psychology at Paolo, Paolo Alta University, while they were both in high school. On September the 17th, 
three days prior to the final vote. So he'd already been 13 days into like really acrimonious testimony. So he'd, he'd already endured 13 days at this point. So the hearing occurred September the 27th. Um, the committee announced that the confirmation would not proceed until both board and Kavanaugh responded in a hearing. The hearing occurred September 27, which was seven days post when the vote should have been taken. Both parties were questioned by members of the Judiciary Committee, as well as an Arizona-based sex crimes prosecutor called Rachel Mitchell. Kavanaugh categorically denied the allegation. So we're dealing just with the first allegation here, Christine Blasey Ford. So A, so Sheila. Christine Blasey Ford came up short on evidence repeatedly, and it seemed that the only details she could remember were those that were most damaging to Kavanaugh, that he was drunk, that he held her down on the bed, etc. She did not remember how she got to the party and how she got home from the party, where the party was or when it was held. Considering that every witness she named, and she named about four, has denied being at the party, including her best friend. Do any of, do you believe her story? Well, the, the first thing that comes to my mind, um, Sharon, would be selective memory. Um, if, if, why wait so long if that was the situation? Why wait 36 years or whatever? Um, if it was such a, a traumatic event, why not go to someone when it happened? Um, and why wait until someone is in that Supreme Court nomination and, you know, as you said, 13 days or whatever into testimony to suddenly um, want to present this? It, it seems very staged to me. I agree. Um, what do you think, Amanda? Do you... Um Considering that every witness you named denied being at the party, including a best friend, for God's sakes, um, do you believe her story? See, this is a hard one because, one, it's it's 30-something years down the track. I mean, you know, that's, I mean, your, your memory, and this is scientifically, your memory is, um, you know, even your memory isn't considered... Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, infallible anymore because they've proven that our, our mind and, and our brain uh, will actually create a collage um, of, of memory. So, you know, even though we sit there and go, I can remember it like it was yesterday, well, actually you don't. It's a, it's a, you, your brain will actually fill in the gaps and, and create a collage uh, around specific emotions and thoughts and stuff like that. Did something happen 36 years ago for her? Maybe. Was it Kavanaugh? That is really hard to prove now. I mean, you know, unless it's a Monica Lewinsky style thing where she's got a dress that has, you know, beautiful evidence on it. You know, the, it, it's it's um it's you know it really to a certain to to an extent it is hearsay. It is. It is a collaborations of emotions that she felt 36 years ago that have imprinted her brain. Um, you know, again, I mean, there's a, there's a part of me that goes, okay, she waited so long into his actual thing. Was she not expecting him to get it? Or, you know, uh, or was it that, um, again, was it, you know, brought up? Uh, you know, again, was it staged um, from okay, someone that had had... Yeah, I should just yeah, I mean, out. She she didn't wait that long. She actually submitted a letter prior. Di uh, yeah. Senator Diane Feinstein sat on the letter. Ah. So, yeah. So I just wanted to clarify that she had actually submitted the letter. She wanted to yeah. remain anonymous, and then she was pretty much outed by. She, she, there was an article in the Washington Post. And then Diane Feinstein sat on the letter that she had. So she said, so, yeah. Well, then, the, but then that changes it, doesn't it? Like, I mean, if she's, if she submitted the letter and the letter was sat on, well, then that's, I mean, it, it sort of puts a little bit of something to it. But yeah, again, I mean, I mean, he's been a, he's been a, a, a you know, a district court judge, wasn't it? Uh, for how 20 long? Plus, yeah. 20 plus yeah, years. Yeah, and I mean, 
and and he had, and and what good had he done in that time? Um, uh, and and so is it that she was trying to show? I mean, because yes, I mean, as we as we spoke about, Supreme Court judge is in a position where they are in there for a long. Well, he will be in there for a long time, being a young man, um, unless for some reason he is you know, booted out or kicked out or whatever. Um, but, you know, he, he could be potentially in there for a long time. Um, you know, uh, do I believe her story? Do I think something happened to her 36 years ago? Yes, I do, because it's imprinted in her brain somewhere. Does she, you know, is it uh, Mr. Kavanaugh or someone of a similar similar person? Maybe. Um uh, is it? I won't make you. Know, you I won't make you actually say yay or nay. Let Let's see what yeah. Bobby says. Bobby, do you believe her story? Uh, no, I don't believe her story. And uh, even though uh, it was sat on, it was only like a month and a half or something. It wasn't like a real long time. And you know, they may have been sitting on it to see what was going to happen, but. No, I definitely don't believe her story. And the other thing is the just, justice that we couldn't think of is uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That's, ah, that's the one. Yeah. yeah, the one they made the stupid movie about. Have you seen it? Oh my God, it's a joke. <laughs> no, I, no, I haven't seen it. I'm never getting that hour and a half back. I'll tell you, that's an hour and a half. I I should don't don't do it to yourself. It was oh, it was so. I can't, there's not even words to describe it, Bobby, but if you get the option, don't do it. <laughs> it anyway. sounds boring to start with, I mean, you know. Oh, yeah, it's, they've tried to make her out to be this amazing, you know, oh. you know, there are so many women that they could have made an, an, a, 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 you know, bio about, and they chose her for a reason, and it's a political reason, but there are so many other women that are probably more worthy, you know. That's, that's what annoys me, anyway. Next question. So, Sheila, Christine Blasey Ford has also refused to hand over her therapy notes as evidence. Most people believe this is because the therapy notes do not mention Justice Kavanaugh and also contradict how many people were present inside the room where the attack occurred. Apparently, she was attacked by four men. Do you think that the notes should have been handed over to all parties concerned? That's a bit of a tough one, Sharon, when you think <clears throat> client confidentiality uh, and Amanda and I, you know, work mm. with, with people uh, from a client basis. So... Just so that you know, you, the only reason we know about these notes is because she, she did show them to the Washington Post reporter and he wrote about the notes in the article. So she, she's already so, shown the reporter. <laughs> Yeah. If you've already shown them to a reporter, um, then why wouldn't you hand them to a, an investigating party if that's what you were asked to do? It, it doesn't fit, does it? No, it's kind of like she thought it might muddy the waters. That's what I thought. And it will because, one, she didn't mention his name. And, two, she, she, she this is, I think it was a couple of years prior or five years prior that she had the therapy stuff done and the story had changed. So I think that's why she just thought it would be, you know. What, um, what do you think, Bobby? Do you think um, she should have hand, been forced to hand over the notes? Um, I originally was thinking no, because, you know, if the notes are related to her therapy, that should be protected. But uh, listening to what, what you said about giving them to the uh, – to the journalist, then I'm thinking, yeah, if, if it was released to them, that's public and uh, they should be turned over then in their entirety. Amanda, what are your thoughts? Well, if, if she's got notes about the particular incident, yes. Anything else regarding anything else she's spoken about, censor it. Like if, if she doesn't want to talk about, you know, um, you know, like, you know, if she's talking about a range of things, like you know, say, say for instance, there might have been other other forms of of violence or or assault or whatever in her in her world, and she's spoken about them, but she doesn't want them out. Well, then censor them and just 
disclose the part that relates to, you know, um, that, that she's obviously shared. Um, but that has to be on her own merit too. Um, if the um, reporter has purely cited it and taken notes and then created these things, so that's all she's done as proof that that had happened or that she's experienced this, then, yeah, I mean, it's it's such a hard thing because she really should be, like, if she's prepared to show them to a reporter, well, like, yeah, why well, not the investigating officer? But, y- yeah, it kind of seems, like, it kind of seems weird that you wouldn't show them if you've shown them to a reporter, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so, Bobby, Senator Dianne Feinstein, as we discussed earlier, who's a Democrat from California, sat on Christine Blasey Ford's letter of her account from July the 30th through to September the 17th, the entire time Justice Kavanaugh was being dissected by her Democrat colleagues unmercifully. Um, Should uh, Senator Feinstein have made the letter public the moment it was received? And as she didn't, what do you think were her true motivations there? Yes, um, I think she should have, you know, made it, you know, given it to the rest of them, you know, when she received it. And uh, the only reason I can think of why she didn't was that she was holding it to see if if it would be needed. You know, if it looked like things, you know, were going okay without it, I think she would have just not given it. But to do that, that would mean that she didn't believe it was real. Because it was like, you only use it if, if we're at that point. It's like... It's yeah, like- yeah, but I mean, whenever you... It, maybe she believed it was real. Who knows? But whenever you, whenever you toss that into the mix, is anybody else going to believe it's real? You know, and maybe she figured, why take the chance? I'll see if I need it. Um, Amanda, what do you think were her true motivations in holding on to that letter? Um, well, one, I think she should have made the letter. Um, you know. I think I think she should have I think she should have made the letter letter public the moment it came out. I mean, this like again, this isn't a uh, you know a, 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 a small position they're filling. It's not like a little PA or something like that. This is Supreme Court judge. Um, what were her things? I mean, look, maybe maybe the I mean, you know, at the end of the day, she you know, Miss Miss Senator Diane, uh, you know, maybe she was looking to use it as a bit of a uh, a, a leverage later on, you know what I mean? Like, because at the end of the day, I mean, she was a Democrat uh, or she's a Democrat-aligned, uh, you know, um, senator. So, you know, uh, was she was she hoping was she hoping to use it for her own benefit? You know what I mean? Like, well, you know, Mr. Supreme Court Judge, Mr. Kavanaugh, I have some damning evidence against you, and uh, you know, I could easily use this. Or was she, you know, um, you know, in, in order to get something that I need for, uh, you know, good old California? Like, was she looking to use it as a bit of a, a, uh, you know, greasing of the, the, um, you know, the, the, you know, the pot so that she could get what she wanted? Um, you know what I mean? Like, at yeah, the end of the day, I mean, it's, it, it's, you know, at the end of the day, why would you, why would you hold on to a piece of information like that when? You know, you know that there is, you know, that this is such a big, big position to be filling. Like, I mean, it's. I think yeah. I, personally, I think she held, she held on to it that long because the whole purpose of this um, attack on Kavanaugh was to delay him getting on the Supreme Court before the midterms, and mm. because she was expecting them to have this blue wave, which didn't, which turned out to be a bit of a puddle, more of a blue puddle than a wave. And um, they got the House, but they didn't get the Senate. And um, Mm -hmm. and I think she was hoping that they'd have this blue wave. And after the midterms, if they delayed Kavanaugh, they could just all say no, basically. They just have a vote and vote no. Um, So that's what I think the actual motivation was. What do you think, Sheila? Yeah, I'm pretty much with you. But the word in the back of my mind, though, would be blackmail, as Amanda was saying. Is it, you you know... You've gone right to the blackmail. (laughs) (laughs) Well... I've stayed a little bit above, you know. (laughs) You did. But 
looking at it from the perspective of if you've got a document, an incriminating supposedly document against someone in a position of power, and you are, you know, a senator who's part of this whole judgment situation, why would you not, as Amanda said, hand it over at the time? Wow, this has just come in, this is important, this needs to be shared. The fact that you sit on it for six weeks or something says you've got an ulterior motive from my perspective. Mm. Exactly. We're, we're almost up to the hour, guys. Uh, get the music for a break, I would think, so we'll just be aware of that one. Okay, shall I keep going for a bit, though? Yep. Great. Okay, so Bobby, memory issues may have been a problem for the attack after 36 years, but what do you think, what do you all think about her inability to recall if she did or did not present the Washington Post with a copy of the therapy notes two weeks Listen, prior to the Kavanaugh right hearing? Now so keep in mind the article right talked about the notes. Okay, so Bobby, what do you think about... I think she definitely should remember that, and uh, she must have had other motives, you know, for for saying that she maybe didn't. Even though it was in the article, I mean, how could the Washington Post have actually quoted the, the the you know the amount of people in the room and things like that, and, and Kavanaugh not being mentioned, if they hadn't actually seen the note? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. I think you know she definitely should remember that, and uh, there must be other motives. Um, Amanda, what do you think? Um, do, you, do you do you think this is dodgy? Her memory issues. I mean, as you said earlier, you actually said before, thirty six years ago. Yeah, I can understand memory issues. Can you understand a couple of weeks prior? Studio B. Momentary Zen. No, not with something that big. I mean. Forgetting what you had yesterday for breakfast or two weeks ago, okay, I can understand that. But yeah, the whole uh, you know showing or not showing information to the Washington Post, yeah, like when when you were the one that was the source, that is a little bit shady. Sheila, are you are you on the bus? <laughs> um, I think it's very shady, personally. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, we, we, and now a holiday message to our favorite people in all the world, our listeners. <laughs> Revolution Radio <laughs> is you. It, now, thanks it, to your it, continuing like, support, like Revolution like Radio will embark on its sixth long year, long bigger long and long better long than, long than long ever. Long you, long the long listeners, long have made Revolution long Radio long what long it is, the number one commercial-free, listener-supported talk radio station on the web and in the world. With 24 hours of live programming, 92 hosts on two established networks, Studio A and um, Studio B, delivering directly to you the Don't most cutting-edge information Don't available. In fact, yeah. you, the I'd listeners, have gone on to be some of our most that. popular radio hosts. You, the listener, offer feedback that molds our programming to appeal to our worldwide audience. In fact, you, the listener, provide us with eyes and ears on the ground to give us the inside scoop on stories the mainstream media fears to touch, reporting about newsworthy events in your area and you the listener are the lifeblood of this station and we thank you for being such a treasured member of our revolution radio family and so this holiday season from all of us to all of you have a happy and safe holiday season and let's make this new year a success once again together thank you The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host... And you're back with Sheila Kennedy. Welcome to the One Percent and the Oddities E Club last Thursday of the month round table with my wonderful co-host uh, Bobby Vicarious, who also produces for us, 
and Sharon Rowland, editor of Oddity Z Club magazine, and our wonderful guest this evening, Amanda Jean Deering. So, as I said earlier, Revolution Radio, we are the number one, 100% listener supported radio station, bringing tonight a very, very interesting show to you. So, if you can afford to support Revolution Radio, we really do appreciate it. And if you're open minded and you'd like something, um, that shares a great many interesting things. I highly recommend the Oddities E Club magazine, and you can find that um, on places like Apple. And I'm sure Sharon Ann will tell you where else it's available from as well. And welcome back, Sharon Ann, Bobby, and Amanda. Hi, guys. Hey. Hi. I um I raced and reheated some pizza, and then you started talking. <laughs> well, that sounds good. <laughs> I know, it look, looks good. Um, so we're up to, um, ooh, we'll go to Amanda to start. She, um, Christine Blasey Ford also could not remember if she took a polygraph test on the same day as her grandmother's funeral. Again, this, ha this funeral occurred less than a month prior. Out of 10, is she telling porky pies? What do you think? Ooh, uh, look, that's, I mean, okay, grandmother's funeral, depends on how close she is, you could forget her doing something, but that, again, a polygraph is not something that you do every day, so I, I kind of, I kind of feel like she's telling a bit of a porky if she did or didn't, because regardless of what it is, if she, if she's saying she can't remember, that's, uh, you know, a, a polygraph isn't something you go to, yeah, and just, yeah, it, it's not a simple process. So I, I couldn't imagine you forgetting going on that, going and doing it. I agree. Yeah. What are you, Bobby? I've uh, <clears throat> never heard of porky pies, but I get the gist. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, that she should definitely remember it. I mean, maybe you could argue that, you know, the trauma of her grandmother's death you know, affected her, but still, I, I, I think she would remember it, and, uh, yeah. So, Sheila, out of, what, from one through to ten, what's her porky pie rating? Oh, I reckon she's probably a ten plus, personally. Yeah, oh, I didn't, <laughs> but I, I think she's a definite ten, that's for sure. Um, so, Amanda, do you want to give us a porky pie rating, one to ten? Yeah, look, I'm gonna I'm gonna say probably a ten. Like that's yeah. Like I said, you can't forget a polygraph test. You know, right. so maybe the day she could forget the day, but not necessarily actually doing it. You know, what I mean, like yeah. And I, I, it's funny after writing out our our notes for tonight, I did a bit more research, and do you know what? They only asked her two questions. Really? The joking. No, and do you know what? To, isn't like, I don't know if what I see in a movie when they do a polygraph is the same as in reality, but usually the first two questions are, what's your name? It's it's like a baseline to work out if they're lying or not. They ask yes. them to say something truthfully and something. So if they only ask the two questions, did she actually have a polygraph? Well, I'm assuming that the ones that were used to calibrate it are not counted there. Oh, okay. Mm. I'm hoping you're right, Bobby, because otherwise, I don't think that she, I mean, even even in that situation, if the baseline was in place and then she was asked, the two, I still think that's a very, that's not a, a long time, <laughs> a large amount of questions to ask somebody. Surely there's a mm. lot of questions you could be asked. Do you know what the two questions are? No, no, they didn't. It was privileged or whatever. Um, but I, I just thought that was interesting mm. too. That I just found that out, and I'm just a bit gobsmacked because I just did you all just expect it to? She'd at least have like eight or nine questions thrown at her, rather than yeah. two. Seems a little pathetic. Mm. Anyway. But then what two does is it says to people that they can now say, "Oh, well, she passed the polygraph," but yeah. you don't tell anyone that she's only she only got asked two questions. So to me, that's kind of fraudulent because I'd expect that I wouldn't give that much weight. Is are you on? Am I thinking differently here to, to everybody else? 
I, I wouldn't no. think that was a good polygraph if you only had two questions. Yeah, and I seem to remember, I could be wrong, something about maybe she was, like she was teaching people how to pass a polygraph exam? Yeah, that came out later. She, she actually had a, a good friend who was applying for a role in the FBI, I think, Bobby, or the DOD. And she, she, her friend asked her to give her some coaching on how to pass polygraphs. And she actually said, she answered a question in the hearing saying that she had never done anything like that previously. So she actually lied to the committee. Wow. And that didn't come out till later as well. So, you know, again, porky pies. Okay, so back to Amanda. Amanda, the final nail in her coffin for me was the fact that she used an additional door being added to her home as support for her trauma from the Kavanaugh attack when documents revealed that it had been put in to allow her to rent a spare room to a student years earlier. So basically what she'd said is she, because of the trauma that she'd experienced from Kavanaugh, she'd insisted that they renovate their house to have two exits so she could get away from somebody, you know, attacking her. But what actually happened was um, they went to the building authority and discovered that it actually went in like five or six years prior to her accusation. So it wasn't a recent addition. And at the time on the submission to the building authority, it was to allow them to rent it out to students. So again, another porky pie. So, so just in general, guys, is anyone here still on board the Ford train? No. So I, I, never, I never was. <laughs> <laughs> was I from the moment she opened her mouth? Okay, Amanda, how's your how's your bleeding heart? Still bleeding? <laughs> <laughs> no, look, look, it's one of those. Like I said, her, her story's filled with holes, and it has been from the beginning. Like I said, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I don't dismiss that she may have had something happen thirty six years ago. Um, but the thing is, I think it's just there's so much circumstantial evidence and and you know and porky pie telling uh that you know there's just you know like it's just too too full of holes to be able to really sort of cement it like and that's what makes it really hard is is you know it's if she's a, if she's a victim yeah okay cool you know you want to you want to support them and, and help them thing but there just seems to be so many so many so many holes in these in the in the in the descriptions and all that sort of stuff, so uh, it makes it it makes it very hard to sort of go, okay, yeah, no, look, you something happened to you, but uh, you know when this happens, you're sort of like, okay, but you're not really giving us either the full story or the whole story or any of the story for that matter, you know. So, am I? On, I mean, I, I was never really, never really on it because it just seemed really. Um, you know, yeah, 36 years later. I mean, that's that's huge. I mean, he'd already been a judge for how long? Why why was there no, none of it being brought forward even before that, even before he went yeah. up for the nomination? Yeah, I agree. I was going to ask yeah. you another question, but I think I'm the only one here that actually saw the, um, the committee hearing where the Arizona um, sec, uh, prosecutor, Rachel Mitchell, um, spoke to her. Did anybody else see that, or is, am I just the only one? Um, no. Okay. So, basically, um, so we'll skip that last question and we'll go on to number three on the next page. Does anybody else feel like she's been porked enough? It's like beating a dead horse that we <laughs> should push on to the next question, next series of questions. Oh no 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 no! She's just the first accuser. We're now, we're now going on to the second accuser. He was accused by three independent women. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so on the third one, on September the 23rd, a second woman, Deborah Ramirez, accused Kavanaugh of sexual assault in 1983, when apparently he exposed himself and thrust his genitalia into her face during a party in a dorm room at Yale University when they, where they, when they were both students in the early 80s. Again, Kavanaugh categorically denied the allegation. So we'll start with Bobby. This allegation came out of nowhere six days after the Ford allegations. 
what do you all, what do you think about the timing? Yeah, I think the timing is just too uh, coincidental and it makes it unbelievable to me. Yeah. Sheila, would you classify a drunk man waving his junk in your face at a frat party as an attack? I, I thought about this when I read it and I actually laughed, Sharon. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think if you were um, the sort of person who was going to go to a drunken frat party that you'd probably have some level of expectation that something might happen like that. Well, if anyone's watched Animal House, definitely. I mean, mm. or na Bad Neighbours, or any of those movies. Um, I mean, I, we're Australian, so we don't. We don't, that's the only kind of place I can go to for a reference. Um, Bobby, maybe we should ask Bobby. Bobby, would you classify <laughs> a drunk man waving his junk in your face at a frat party as an attack? Pretend um, to I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I would think it's more exposure rather than an attack. Yeah, it's like a flasher, isn't it? Or yeah, a, unless he was, like, hitting her in the face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's not get into that. We, we have a special place in Australian history about that, don't we, don't we ladies? <laughs> well, we'll tell you about it one day, Bobby. It's, we don't want to bring it up that often, though. It's embarrassing to Australia. Um, now... Uh, Amanda, the FBI were forced by Senator Flake to perform a more thorough investigation and the president gave them a week. Following this investigation, the FBI interviewed Ramirez and two of her alleged eyewitnesses to the, jail, the Yale University incident. Agents also interviewed a close friend of Ramirez from college. The result was no corroboration of the allegations at all. The New York Times interviewed several dozen of her classmates in an attempt to corroborate her story and could find no one with first-hand knowledge. This has led to Ramirez being referred to the Senate leader by the Senate leader to authorities to be charged. Do you think, Amanda, she should be charged for fraud like a number of other false accusers have been? So there's been like three of them now that have falsely accused him and they've just been referred to the FBI or to law, law enforcement. Do you think, though, that Ramirez should have been? Well, yeah, because, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, again, if they're falsely accusing um, due to being paid money or whatever or, or, or whatever it is that, you know, whatever or, or whatever they, they're expecting to get out of this, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, uh, you know, is it just uh, jumping on the bandwagon and hoping for a payout? Um, or is it, you know, um, actually there was something serious going on. Um, it seems a little bit weird that, yeah, it's six days after Ford comes out, which is, but then again, if they're trying to build a case, what you want is more people to come forward. So, you know, I don't know. It's, uh, yes, I do, because if it's, if there's no collaborative evidence that, that proves that that happened, uh then yeah again you know look that's that's a you know you're you're you know it's defamation of character you know it's it's you know it's um you know so and and a, and a character of high standing so you sort of i mean again you you don't want to um you know he's not untouchable but the thing is you you don't want to defame his character if it's not true, you know. I mean, if it's if it's not, well, if there's no evidence to back it up, like there was, there's been absolutely zero evidence, and he's not been given the usual innocent before proven guilty. Basically, he was put, he was in a in the position of um, being guilty, mm. and then had had every. Had, and then was it basically was attacked for like 14 days prior then attacked by three people, then in, after six, he's already been, the FBI had already investigated him six times prior. He then went through uh, two FBI additional investigations and they, they found nothing. It's mm. just, yeah, so he, I feel really bad for the dude, to be honest. Um, Bobby, mm. you can answer the next one because you're a man. So give us the male perspective here. 
If you did, you mean the thing about the fraud, right? Oh, or are you, oh are you? no, no, no. You're up. We're on to the next one, which is during the Kavanaugh hearings, the Me Too movement went into overdrive, and the hashtag Believe Women was born. How much damage and or support do you think this Believe Every Woman mantra provided Justice Kavanaugh? Um, I don't think it would affect him too much because it's like a separate issue and, uh, you know, seems a little ridiculous to me. But, you know, so I think I think it's a separate issue which shouldn't have affected him. I actually think it helped him because it made a lot of people see the situation as ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. And I also think that when Ramirez made her allegations, that completely blew Lazy Ford out of the water. I think at that point, everyone still kind of had, you know, a bleeding heart for her. And um, because they also felt that she'd been set up by Diane Feinstein. So, but then I think when Ramirez came out, that was the end of it. So, Sheila... And Amanda, which is one of you wish to answer this, um, as, as we just read, during the Kavanaugh hearings, the Me Too movement went into overdrive and this hashtag Believe Women was born. How much damage from a female perspective or support do you think this Believe Every Woman mantra provided him? Which one of you want it? Mm. I don't think it actually. I don't think it actually damaged him. That's that's the thing. I don't think it actually damaged him. It it's damaged just. I, 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 the thing is, I think what it's done is is um, really. I, look, at the end of the day, it hasn't damaged him. It, he, he's still been put in the position, hasn't he? Like he's. The last I read, he'd, he'd, he'd gotten through. So it hasn't actually really damaged him uh, as such. Um, I think the lack of evidence helped him. Um, and, and that was the thing. He had, he had three women come up and, and make accusations, but there was not enough evidence and not even enough. And, and, and you couldn't even say it was really circumstantial evidence that, that could put him there. That's what I mean. Like there's, it, it was all, it was, it, yeah. So, you know, did it hurt him? No, if anything, I think it actually helped him because he was able to actually, with, without, like, he was able to have the FBI turn around and say, no, nah, he didn't do it. What yeah, more I, backing do you want? I mean, yeah. If anything, I, it's just, it's made a, a lot of women super angry in the world again. Like, it's it's just, yeah, you know I mean, it, it's pushed, it's pushed a real... Um, it, you know, at the end of the day, it's not hurting Kavanaugh. It's going to hurt all the good men in the world. You know what I mean? It's going to hurt all the the men that are, you know, good good blokes. You know, that's because it's, it's um, you know, you're going to get those ladies that are just going to, you know, they're, they're already looking for a fight. Did it, was Kavanaugh hopefully the meal ticket? Yeah, but I don't think it actually hurt him. Do you know, do you know what's really sad? Now that the Democrats have won the House, one of their promises, they made a couple of promises. One was to impeach the president, and the second promise they made was to drag Kavanaugh back into the court system. Oh, wow. Even after it's been proved that, you know, these women were just... Oh, anyway. Sheila, on September the 28th, the Senate Judiciary Committee voted 11 to 10 to send the nomination to the floor, where senators would decide whether or not to proceed with the confirmation in the following week. On the same day, after a request from Senator Jeff Flake, who's actually, who was a Republican in Arizona, he's about to, he got voted out because of this thing, followed by a request from the Senate Judiciary Committee, President Trump ordered a week-long FBI supplementary background investigation into sexual assault allegations against Kavanaugh. Should Senator Flake not have been such a snowflake? He, he actually got ambushed in a lift by two women screaming at him, basically. And it, when he went into the lift, he was pro Kavanaugh. When he came out, I think they um, damaged him. And he, he then appealed and said, we need an extra week. Um, so what do you think? Do you think he should have um, stood his ground? Mm. That's 
that's an interesting one because um, why is it just, from my perspective, why is it just one senator saying uh, we need this? Wouldn't you think if, if you've got 21 senators or people from the Judiciary Committee, should be more than one say, wow, this doesn't seem right, we need more information? Mm. Well, all the Democrats were saying it as well, but he was the only Republican that actually said it. Okay. He, um, mm. basically he got beat. He, he was, he was um, I think he was trying to appeal to the base in his state and um, they voted him out anyway because they were disgusted with him, I think, because he was he, he turned on um, Kavanaugh. And I think that's what really yeah. put him. Um, Finished him off. Yeah. yeah, you're probably right. So um, what do you think, Bobby? You're over there. Do you think um, uh, Senator Blake was a smoker? <coughs> See, I was a little confused about this one, but basically what I've got out of it is that... Um, I think that, uh, see, he's a Republican, and yeah. and it says on the same day after the request from Flake, um, it was followed by a request from the Senate Judiciary Committee, which I guess he was the head or a member of, and then President Trump ordered a week-long supplemental background investigation. So I'm thinking that this is almost like the icing on the cake. It's like after we've you know, totally proven Kavanaugh clean. Let's throw on another week of a of a FBI investigation. You think it might have been a planned thing? I'm I'm thinking it it couldn't hurt it couldn't hurt Kavanaugh or Trump. I mean, it was it was already at the point where they were sure that there was no problem with him, and since since the Senate Judiciary Committee wanted it. Why not give it to him and let him do another week and, you know, can't hurt? I suppose um, at this point we're at, you're at September the 28th, which meant the initial vote was supposed to, let me look back, was supposed to have occurred on September the 20th. So, so at that point it had already been delayed eight days. So, um, and now they were asking for another seven days and midterms were still, well, the midterms are still a good four weeks away. So, and I suppose from uh, the Republicans' perspective, they were probably looking at it as, okay, this is just another delay and we don't want any more delays. But you're, um, in hindsight, yeah, I can see why you'd look at it that way because it is, it was icing on the cake, you're right. Um, Sheila. On September the 26th, Michael Abernati released, or he's also known as the creepy porn lawyer. You might have heard that that phrase. Have you heard that? No. That's his, that's his nickname online. Um, he, he made quite a few appearances on CNN and um, they, the Fox people nicknamed him creepy porn lawyer, which is awful, but anyway, they did. He represented Stormy Daniels, you see. So that's how okay, I yep. So anyway, on September the 26th, Michael Avenatti released a sworn declaration by a third woman, a Julie Swetnick, who alleged another incident had occurred. Um, so we'll start with Sheila. Julie Swetnick alleged Kavanaugh would cause girls to become inebriated and disoriented so they could then be gang raped in a side room or bedroom by a train of numerous boys during the early 1980s, while students were in high school or college. She also said that on one occasion she was raped but kept attending the parties after. Do you think that this is normal behaviour post abuse to attend more parties and not to raise the alarm? No, I, I personally do not. And she's not actually saying that he um, had any form of um, sexual conduct with her is she she's saying he would cause girls to become inebriated and disoriented well surely the girls had a choice whether they drank or not but if i mean if you if you had been gang raped at a party would you be going back to a party no of course not 
And she, apparently she returned to these parties for over a year, so multiple parties. Yeah. Um, yeah. Amanda, what do you it's think? another one that raises a red flag, isn't it? Yeah. But Amanda, what do you think? Would you have done that? No, because, I mean, at the end of the day, you look at someone that's been through that sort of trauma, the last thing you want to do is be put back in that situation. Mm. I mean, that's, I mean, that, I mean, even, like, I mean, you, you look at, you look at someone that is, you know, um, uh, kidnapped. I mean, you know, you look at someone that has the the um, uh, the thing where they've been kidnapped and they've been kept and they become attached to their their um, you know kidnapper. Um, that's that's different to this situation where she's supposedly being gang raped and then still continues to go to the same place where she has been um, assaulted, most people, when they have some form of assault like that, they they don't go near the place of the issue. They don't go near the, um, you know, they, they don't want to relive any of that situation. Um, and, you know, places like going back to the same party would trigger memories and it doesn't matter if, if they were inebriated or not, it would still be triggering that deep, subconscious memory so yeah i don't that that just seems really odd that yeah. you know um no, i'm with you i mean i i can't the thing that gets me is she knew it was happening she didn't raise the alarm yeah. I, I would raise the alarm if i knew i wouldn't let lead other girls to the slaughter i mean that's just not yeah. a normal human even, even though it was the 1980s where you know uh, crazy stuff was still happening, you know, post seventies. But yeah, like I mean, that was a thing. It's you, you. There, there would still be, yeah, there would still be a reason to raise the alarm. Like it, you know, the the eighties were all about, you know, women starting to gain their 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 independence in the way of of being, you know, um. You know, like you know, to, to when they, you know, they started, they started working, they started holding positions and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, like to, if she was a, you know, if she was at college and and, you know, and, and someone that was, you know, wanting to become something. I mean, you sort of think, well, you know, stand up and be counted. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I find that, yeah, I find it a bit of a, a big sort of a red flag there. Yeah. Mm. Okay, Bobby, the next question is yours. Uh, the report of the attack um, when it was investigated quoted a handful of unnamed witnesses who questioned Swetnick's credibility. Two men who had previously had relationships with her, a Dennis Ketterer and a Richard Benicki, said she had never mentioned Kavanaugh or being the victim of sexual assault. How much credence would you give to the men, Bobby? Swetnick had been in a past relationship with both. Well, see, this one depends because, in my mind, it depends on the kind of relationship she had with these men, how deep of a relationship. I would think that, you know, this might be something that she would only reveal to someone that she had a real deep relationship with. Mm. Yeah, I was kind of thinking the same thing. I, I actually saw one of these guys interviewed, and I thought I was thinking the same thing to myself. I mean... It looks like, like one of them, I think she had quite a, a few years of a relationship with, but the other one was a shorter period of time. And I was thinking, well, I'd probably give more credence to the guy who was in the relationship with for years than the, the six-week guy, don't you? Hmm. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I was going. But, I mean, even you could be in a relationship with someone for two years and still never get to a real deep level. But, and you, you know. also don't know how the relationships ended. They may have been acrimonious, hey? So, and then this is the guys getting back at her or something. So, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I'd give much credence. Do you agree, Bobby? Or, or do you think, you know, just don't know? Yeah, I, 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 because I don't know any of these variables, yeah, I think I wouldn't give too much credence. So, Sheila, the FBI report concluded that there not only was not enough evidence to back Swetnick's claims, it also appeared that Julie Swetnick and Mr. Abernathy criminally, criminally conspired to make materially false statements to the committee and to obstruct the committee's investigation. 
Senator Grassley asked Attorney General Jeff Sessions and the FBI on October the 25th to investigate further. Do you agree, Sheila, this was the correct course of action, or do you think this would put new accusers off making accusations? Well, I think if they've, if it's seen and there's obviously some type of evidence to say that they've um, conspired to make false statements and materially false statements mean, you know, there may well be, as I said, a, a monetary payoff in there somewhere. Well, the, this guy isn't doing this for nothing, is he? Um, mm. Taking on someone's case. Yes, you can have the, you know, look, I'll look after you and I'll um, support you and so on. But the whole thing, as I said, just has that odd odour to it that says, no, there's something really dodgy here. And does it um, put new accusers off making accusations? If they're telling the truth, why would it? If they've got nothing to back up what they're saying and it's a false accusation, then let's hope it does put them off. Yeah. So um, we'll start with Bobby now on the final question. In hindsight, Bobby, why do you believe the Senate made the right or the wrong decision to send Justice Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court? I think they made the right decision to send him to the Supreme Court because the evidence was totally insufficient. And in some cases, it was just totally ridiculous. So, uh, yeah, I think they made the right call. I think he's going to do a good job. Yeah, I agree. Amanda, do you think they made the right or wrong decision and why? I think they made the right decision with the information they had. Like, at the end of the day, they can, they, if they're to remain, uh, you know, um, unbiased, they've got to look at the information and go, right, is there enough evidence? No, there's not. Is he, does all his previous judge, uh, you know, or, or career choices warrant him to be put forward? Yes. So, yes, we've had this come up. No, there's not enough evidence. He has been in investigated how many times and found to be not guilty. This is, his, this is his career as a judge who he has obviously had a very good career to be put forward. Uh, you know, and he's been a very good judge. So, yeah, I think they did the right thing. If if they have, if it has been done all above board, you know what I mean, if if they've taken everything into account and and looked at it in a very unbiased way, yeah, they did make the right decision. Yeah. You know what I mean? um, Sheila, um, in hindsight, why do you believe the Senate made the right or the wrong decision to send Justice Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court? Well, I, I, I'm with Bobby and Amanda. I, I believe it's the right decision. And allowing that the man's had some enormous spotlight shone on him and come out smelling, you know, pretty yeah. clean. Um, he's been character assassinated left, right and centre and nothing to support that. Um, I would hope that from the perspective of other people going to the Supreme Court, um, that they'd this man to start with. I'd, um, I found when, when they were talking about a couple of things with him, um, I felt that when they were talking about, you know, the things he, that had been written in his yearbook, I, I went through the 80s in school. In my, I graduated in 85. So when they were talking about boofing and and games and stuff, I recognised the the wording that was actually written in his books, and I agreed with him as to the definition of those things. But I found um, a lot of the people were in the media were looking at the current times definition of things. But I mean, it's like the word gay. You know, 50 years ago, gay did not mean homosexual man or a homosexual act being gay it nice. meant being happy and i in the 80s boofing did mean farting you know it did mean and the game was a, a game that we even played over here in australia um and i just found it amazing that the media 
didn't know enough or hadn't done enough research to work that out. That's when I kind of looked at, looked at the media and thought, oh my God, you just you either do no research or you're just doing this on purpose. I think that's one of the first yeah. times I actually looked at them and thought, okay, you really are biased, and this is this is proof to me of it. So, um, so yeah, so I think I think they made the right decision. Okay, mm, good. Guys, are you ready to move on to the second topic? Mm-hmm. Right. Go for it. So this is um, around mid 2017. Uh, Putin and Trump uh, got together, and so that I've called this the Putin and Trump versus the USA intelligence community because that's what they kind of wanted to sell it as. So. The 2018 Russia-United States summit was a summit meeting between the United States President Donald Trump and the Russian President Vladimir Putin, hence also known as the Trump-Putin summit. Um, so it was, in two, it was in July 16, 2018, in Helsinki, in Finland. It was hosted by the President of Finland, Sauli Ninsko, I can't pronounce that one, during a post-summit joint press conference with Putin Trump declined to acknowledge Russian interference in the 2016 US elections. Trump's remarks provoked an uproar across the political spectrum. He just he has foot and mouth disease, and basically that day he had a lot of foot and mouth. He couldn't fit. In fact, the moment he opened his mouth to put one foot in, the other one fell out. Controversial remark. During an interview on the eve of the summit with CBS News, Trump said Russia was a foe in certain aspects and called the EU the biggest trade foe of the United States. Trump tweeted on the morning of the summit that the relationship between Russia and the US has never been worse. He blamed this on foolishness and stupidity on the part of the US and referenced the ongoing special counsel investigation into Russia interference in the 2016 elections, calling it a witch hunt. And he's still calling it rich on. He also indicated his inclination to accept Putin's denial of Russian interference, saying, President Putin says it's not Russia. I don't see any reason why it would be. One day later, Trump amended his remarks, contending that he had misspoken and should have said, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be. Topics Trump announced to be discussed at the summit included the situations in Syria and the Ukraine. Trump and Putin met privately for two hours without aides or note takers and accompanied only by their respective interpreters. Trump's interpreter was Marina Gross. The meeting had been scheduled for 90 minutes but lasted two hours. There were later calls by Senator Janine, oh, sorry, John, oh, I, can't spell, I can't even pronounce that now, Shane, and Representative Bill Pascrell, for Trump's interpreter, Marina Gross, to testify before Congress. The private meeting was followed by a working lunch that included senior advisors. So that's the background to the question. Ready to go? Okay. With start with Amanda. Considering that any collusion between President Trump and Russia had been denied a day earlier by the FBI, there was a press conference held, and this investigation had been ongoing for two years with daily questions and accusations from the US and overseas media outlets. Do you blame President Trump for not knowing who was telling the truth? Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> because I think, you know, it would be the case of, you know, in all honesty, probably most of America wouldn't know who's telling the truth. Yeah, you know I mean, like it's, mm. you know, it's it's because and, and and at the end of the day, it is, you know, like everyone's covering their ass. Like at the end of the day, everyone's covering their their role or play or or whatever it is. I mean, it, you know, politics isn't about everyone being open and forthcoming. If we're honest. Yeah, you know I mean, so um, does you know? Do I blame him for being, um, you know, for having no idea? No, I don't. And I and I think he's, I think, you know, um, yeah. Look, it, it, it's it's a confusing process to start with, I and I think, yeah, just trying to be delicate with an, a foreign mm. leader. I mean, 
Yeah. The last thing I do is stand up on stage and start throwing accusations around, is it? It's um mm. like it's delicate, you know, and obviously he went there to mend fences, not to create new ones. Um but yeah. we well, we give us the, the US perspective, considering that any collusion, I mean, it's been over two years and they still haven't found collusion. Um, they have actually, though, um, they, they kicked out quite a few of the Russian ambassadors, though, and accused them of, well, they didn't get to kick them out. They actually left the country prior. <laughs> so they, after they left the country, they then said, oh, these were the ones that did it, I think. Um, what do you think, Bobby? Do you blame President Trump for not knowing who was telling the truth, or do you think he should have just, um, you know, stuck to the U.S. side of things? I I think he was being diplomatic. I I think he knew. I I think he just uh, you know wanted to be diplomatic. I mean, what's he going to say? I don't believe uh, you know the, the FBI, <laughs> or you know I I think he wanted. To, being diplomatic, I think he wants to forge, you know, closer ties with Russia. Look, that's, that's what I picked up from it, too. I, I thought he was just trying to kind of fence it. And I think I think that taught him a big lesson, which is don't fence it. <laughs> because it doesn't, mm. you, you know, you're going to, all you're going to get is um, a sore ass, you know. <laughs> you've mm. got you've got to make a decision. So, Sheila, should President Trump have sided with the U.S. intelligence services more strongly? AKA, do you think the US intelligence services deserve to be respected after two years of harassment against not only the president, but also his family and friends? No, I don't think they should. I think they um, dug their own grave here, to be honest. I, I would, would totally agree. And I think if we look at what we've heard about the US intelligence services, with the whole Killary thing during the, um, you know, the, the presidential campaign, he really didn't have a lot to like them for, did he? No, not at all. And the reality is, at that point in time, he he had an onslaught of almost two years of being badgered almost daily about Russia. And in his mind, there was there's never been any collusion because he knows he hasn't colluded. And they've still yeah. been bashing him with it. And then he gets in a position where somebody asks that question. And so he's standing there on stage and he's already, he's already had the, argue, the the discussion with Putin. And Putin says, I know nothing about this, of course he would say. And he's looking across the stage at the people he doesn't trust, you know, and thinking, yeah. well, I don't give you anything either. So um, I, I actually think he tried to be delicate like Bobby said, but he's just not good at delicate. He's not a fence sitter. He, he just needs to actually, you know. One of the things I love about Trump is he is an honest, he seems, he honestly answers things. And he honestly, at that point in time, didn't trust anyone. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. where I thought it was coming from. He doesn't trust, you know, what he calls the deep state, you know, these these Obama people that are still stuck in his, um, in the executive arm of, uh, the US government, and he shouldn't. There's some assholes in there, and they're all being cleaned out now. But he probably, in the back of his mind, doesn't trust Putin either. But he, he's also on stage with the man trying to get something done, you know, some kind of agreement. So he can't stand there and, you know, call him out either. Um, I think that that whole situation was handled badly by the press, to be honest. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I think it was kind of like he was he was being set up. Um, that's what came to me later. Like the more I think about it, the more I kind of came away thinking that was a setup. Mm. You know? Yeah, I think you're right. Amanda, what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, how many times has a work work meeting gone over? Like, really? Let's let's be honest. If you're if you're in a in a uh, corporate space, the the, the I mean. I mean, look, even thinking about, you know, us doing this show, the amount of times where we could easily go over and and talk longer and, 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 and span it out, you know, here you've got two, two um, you know, leaders that have come together. You know, he, he, like, at the end of the day, when you look at it, okay, they went for an extra 30 minutes. Who cares? I mean, um, and, and, you know, Trump handled that the way Trump does, which is, well, he, you know, he 
<laughs> he, he's, he's not a diplomatic man. He, he, he's, he, doesn't, he doesn't have that finesse. He doesn't, he, there is nothing about Trump that speaks finesse with talking. He's not Teflon. He's not, you know, um, so, I, I mean, when you look at that, he handled it the way Trump handled things, which is without finesse. Um, you know, very Trumpish. So, um, you know, so should he have backed them? No, because he's he. The, the whole idea is that he's he's not meant to be. He he doesn't he doesn't have to like what they've done. He doesn't even have to like them. I mean. You know, if you if you look even back into um, uh, you know the the JFK, um, you know a, a lot of the JFK theory and stuff like that, he never he was never a big one or a big fan of of the you know the bureaus and things like that either. You know, so um, you know, do, does a president have to have to agree with their security thing? No, I don't I don't think so. So do did he have to back them? No. And do I blame him for having residual feelings toward them after being battered for two years? No. no. I, I, you know, I don't. Because at the end of the day, Trump isn't superhuman. He's not an unemotional man. He, you know, that, that, will, you know, that would still irk or upset or infuriate him have, having been battered. Like, and, and not just him, but his whole family too, you know. So... Um, it yeah, like there was, was particularly some nasty attacks prior to his going to Russia. So, so mm. Bobby, do you think there is any substance in the conspiracy theory that the private meeting, the two-hour private meeting between Trump and Putin, was to exchange information in respect to the Clinton's activities in the U.S.? Um, no, I don't. And it's like it's like as you go through this thing, you can see more and more that they're like clutching at straws, anything that they can possibly drum up to make them look bad or whatever, they're doing it. And it's getting more and more ridiculous. Yeah, I think so too. So, um, Sheila, do you think the timing of the FBI's press conference announcing the lack of collusion, but also the indictment of 12 Russian spies was done on purpose to embarrass Trump? It happened right in the middle of his trip. I'd say yes, very likely. Yeah. Uh, Bobby, Amanda, do you agree? Do you think it was to embarrass him? He was oh, yeah. right when it happened. No, I mean, it was, they, they should have died a, you know, that, I don't even, I think that's also another reason why he answered the way he did, because they just screwed him, you know, literally screwed him diplomatically. Well, we, we know that we have a left-wing press and they've never liked them. And so it's, you know, they're doing any possible thing they can to make them look bad. Yeah, but, but that's on a whole new level. I mean, he was in the country, you know, he was in Finland meeting the, 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 representative, the representative, the leader of that country. So, I mean, you couldn't have put somebody more on the spot if you tried, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so back to Bobby. Trump has literally said he wants friendly, peaceable relations between the two nuclear superpowers. And his ability to sit down and just talk with his enemies, I think, is something to be proud of. However, the supporters of the Democrats, um, their new nicknames, by the way, is the Demon Rats, I think that's hilarious, have condemned his approach. What do you think is peace worth a go? Um... I think that, you know, Trump's way of operating is a good way of operating. You know, he wants to sit down with the leaders, you know, one-on-one -on -one and talk without, you know, without a lot of crap, you know, just, you know, man-to-man -man or whatever, man-to-woman. I think, you know, I think that's the way he operates. And I think it's an admirable approach. And it seems like, you know, if you look at what happened with North Korea, you know, it seems to get good results, although we don't really know the the total outcome of North Korea, but, you know, that's the way he operates. Well, he, he got um, the bodies of the soldiers back and they did not, they stopped launching missiles at islands. Um, so there has actually been some positives already from it, but how much, I, 
I think with somewhere like North Korea, it, it, that's going to be slow and painful over the next 10 years, to be honest. Um, and, but I think that's just how they work. Um, but there's also, I mean, not only there's been, even though he and Putin are always bantering online about each other, I actually think there's, there's an understanding between them, um, especially in relation to immigration. So that seems to be quite prevalent. I mean, if you're going to collude on anything, I wish they'd collude on immigration and mass migration in particular. Um, but he's also sat down with like Mexico and there is, do they have a president? president in Mexico or are they something else? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, no, no, they have a president. Yeah, well, he's he's also made that groundbreaking deal with Mexico, and he, it, which has improved relationships there. And um, it's completely embarrassed and made the Canadian prime minister look like an idiot because here Mexico got it on before, um, you know, that, that idiot who runs um, Canada. Is his election coming up? Because surely people are going to vote him out this time, Bobby. I mean, um, that, I, that I don't know. That would be a good question for Bruce. But I, I don't know the answer to that one. Oh, that's awful. Um, okay. So that, well, I'll start with Amanda. We're going to wrap up shortly with the last question. So we'll start with Amanda. Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich. Sorry, I'm losing <laughs> it. So that's an awful name. Stated in response to the Democrats' call for the president to be tried for treason, by any standard, Trump is tougher on Russia than Obama ever dreamed of. He's expelled 60 Russian agents from the country. He has closed four Russian offices. He has imposed sanctions on over 100 Russian individuals and companies. He has provided offensive weapons to the Ukrainians, which Obama always refused to do. Do you agree with Newt? that all the Democrats, um, it, that he is tougher on Russia than Obama? Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, one thing I give Trump is he is, he is, look, he is treating it like a business. He is treating the United States like any of his businesses. He's not, there is no emotional attachment to, the only emotional attachment he has is to the company. The company is the US of A. Yeah. Like and, and that's one thing I give Trump is that he's actually he's actually going in there. The only emotional attachment he has is to the well being of that the 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 company itself. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to ensure that that company is a viable company and that, that that anything that's not working is being removed. He's cutting away dead wood. He's cutting away, you know, and, and he, he's trying to, he's trying to ensure that, you know, that his company is kept safe from outside influence as much as inside influence. So, yeah, um, I, I have to, I'm agreeing with Newt on this because Newt is right. I mean, Trump is just cutting it. Like, he has been tougher. He has been, you know, more, and, and he's been openly tough, uh, like, on on when it comes to American soil. Like, he's he's being very, no, I'm sorry, but you guys have a history of, of X, Y, Z, so I want to make sure that doesn't happen again. I want to make sure that, and, and by doing that, he's he's been, you know, he, he has expelled and and all that sort of stuff. So I'm agreeing with Newt on this one over, you know, in, in the fact that, you know, he is, he, he's, I can't see how he can be tried for treason when what he's doing is putting America first um, in so many ways. And, and even with the Korean thing and all that sort of stuff, he's, he's treating it like as if you're, dealing with um you know uh you know company other companies and and that's what he's doing yeah, no i agree bobby what do you think do you agree that uh with newt that he is tougher on russia than obama or are you going the democrat way yeah i think i agree and uh, i think trump has kind of got out of his way to you know to seem tougher on russia you know than maybe he really wants to be you know, because of this crap. And uh, I think uh, Trump, you know, I think Trump admires uh, Putin. I think he likes him because 
he understands them, you know, but he's Putin wants the best for his people. And I think Trump does, too. And uh, I was cracking up as you're reading that. You keep saying Newton. And I'm thinking, is that really his name? It's like, you know, it's like, honey, what do you think we should name our son? Oh, Newton sounds like a cute name. What do you think? <laughs> like, really? Maybe he's for something. I don't know. A newt is a, an, a little animal, isn't it, Sheila? Yeah. <laughs> I have newt. Sort of thing, yeah. That's what you put in the witch's butt. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Eye of new. That's what you do. You cut the eye out. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, um, I think we've wrapped up. Sheila, would you like to take us out? What would you like to discuss now? Well, we've got a, two or three minutes left. We're well, probably not even that now. It's just gone nine fifty-seven. So, um, it's been another really interesting show. Thank you, ladies and Bobby. Um, oh, I, I, I always, in, and, I always um, enjoy these. I, I should just add, um, we've got people, put, we've got Stephen Strong coming back in January for part two of his interview on uh, Ancient Origin. Um.